Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our Ask an Expert webinars. Today we'll be looking at how to get hired. This has been put on by the RTPL Midlands Young Planners and Dan Wilson, the RTPL West Midlands Chair for 2020. Just to remind you, all our delegates, that you'll be automatically muted as you arrive into our webinar, so there's no need to turn on your microphones. If you do have a question, please feel free to submit it in the question bar to the right-hand side of your screen. This can be done at any point in time throughout the presentation. Um, we do have over 100 persons registered, so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible, but if you don't get wrong to it today, um, the session will be recorded and we answer as many questions as possible and get back to you. So the format today is much of a question and answer panel discussion and we're joined by Ruth Hoggett, Helen York and Ben Sim. I'll be asking questions and as I said before, feel free to put questions in the question box and I'll, I'll get around to it as quickly as possible. Just to give you a brief overview of the persons who we're speaking to today, I'm going to probably start with Helen York. Uh, Helen's worked at Dudley Metropolitan Borough Council since leaving university in 2004. Her undergraduate degree is in environmental management and she has also completed her master's degree in spatial planning. She's been a chartered member of the RTPI for over 10 years and sponsored many colleagues through the APC process. Helen started her career in a technical supporting role has secured several promotions to the post of principal planning officer. This role sees her managing a development management team at the council and involves securing and enabling training opportunities for staff across the service area, as well as recruitment. Welcome, Helen. We good also evening, have- Daniel. Good evening. We also have Ruth, who worked in recruitment for the last 14 years with the last 12 years specializing in town planning recruitment, primarily within the private sector. She has a psychology degree as well as a year of teacher training from Bristol University. She joined Bart Wilmore this year from a leading property recruitment firm where she had set up and run the National Town Planning Division. She now runs the recruitment operations for Bart and Wilmore um, which includes helping to develop new graduate intake schemes. And that's something that will be open this December. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Finally, we are joined with, we're joined by Ben Sim. Ben graduated from the University of Sheffield with a master's in urban studies and town planning um, in 2008. He's a chartered town planner with over 10 years experience in both public and private sectors. Ben has worked at Warwickshire County Council and has recently joined Highways England in, in January this year as a spatial planner um, in Birmingham. Ben has been an active member of the RTPI, having been Chair of the Young Planners West Midlands in 2012, a Regional Chair of the RTPI West Midlands in 2016, and he's also sat on the RTPI's Education and Lifelong Learning Committee between 2017 and 2019. Ben received the Regional Young Planner Award in 2014 and has also been helping recruit at various, various different levels throughout his career. Welcome, Ben. Right, so we received a few questions beforehand and uh, I thought I'd probably kick this one off, maybe to you, Ruth, trying yeah. to see if you can answer hopefully a very simple but maybe complicated question. Where can people find jobs okay so there's loads of different avenues um there's obviously the main job boards is planning the planner um, which is the official rtpi magazine and online version um up until a few years ago haymarket had that contract so they also have a really strong online presence and that's planningjobs.co.uk um i do find the property job boards quite good as well as the States Gazette, um, Property Jobs, they're particularly good for perhaps more P&D led positions, um, developers quite often advertise with those, um, there's more general ones, there's Indeed, 
read um, of course companies own websites so you can go to the rtpi website search consultancies fire location um, and sector and bring up a list there and check through their websites that's particularly good for graduate intake schemes most companies will usually have a section on there for, for the programs that they run um, the local authority ones tend to advertise more on um, the planner and, and planning jobs um, okay. .co .uk. Um, anything to add to that Helen in terms of from your experience from the private public sector rather where can people find jobs if they're interested yeah, of course. Um, Ruth's um, hit most of the key ones there, which are always worth keeping an eye on. But um, from a local perspective, um, uh, WM Jobs is obviously a, a good place where uh, public sector jobs will be advertised, um, planning jobs specifically. Um, and obviously all the socials associated with um, local authorities and the consultancies privately. But WM Jobs is a big one for West Midlands employers, uh, specifically with regard to public sector. Mm. Ben, obviously you work for a government agency. Anything you want to add to that question in particular from your experience? Um, in terms of civil service jobs, obviously there is the civil service jobs route through gov.uk and obviously that will advertise jobs for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government because we do have an office here in Birmingham um, and that covers other departments as well in terms of the civil service. But for Highways England, we have our Highways England website so that's for spatial planning and environment agency have pretty much the same um so it's worth searching searching those um i would say so as well the county councils tend to have their own job advert sites as well around the west midlands um so it's always worth picking up on those the other one is linkedin linkedin is a great tool to utilize to keep an eye on for jobs and i use it to post jobs when they come out available from from us well, we do have a question about LinkedIn, and we'll get back to that a bit later, but we have one that's already been posted by one of our delegates, and I'm just going to read it out here and just, you know, I'm probably going to start with you, Helen. Um, where would you say is the best places to apply to gain work experience? Any specific organisations you could recommend that employers could be looking for when applying for jobs? I mean, obviously, we are living within a very unusual time now with the global pandemic. Many persons have lost jobs. I myself... Um, was unemployed for about six months and you know gratefully I'm now back at work as you can probably tell from my environment but you know what about work experience um, Helen um, is that something that we still value is it something that could set us apart in terms of new job opportunities yeah, um, one hundred percent. Big, big advocate of work experience. Um, it doesn't matter um, the length or the nature of the experience. Anything within the planning uh, remit is always going to set you above and beyond other candidates who don't have that. Um, as a local authority, I can certainly speak from our experience. We're very keen on on work experience. We try to facilitate that as often as possible. Um, we're in a very unusual environment at the moment. Um, we haven't stopped taking work experience students um, and we have links with local universities where we are taking placement students. It's all being done virtually at the moment. It is different. Um, you don't get the benefit of that office environment and that kind of team dynamic that you necessarily get every day when you are there. Um, however, I don't think that devalues it. I still think it's it's worthwhile uh, going through that process. And I would encourage any um, anyone who's out of work or anyone who hasn't had a lot of work experience or new graduates specifically, speak this as a, as a way forward. Local authorities will always try and facilitate that. And I know lots of the private sector will as well. Um, put yourself out there, ask the question um, and get that secured where you can, even if it was just for a week, it's going to give you um, an invaluable insight into where the planning system works, whichever side of the fence that is on. Ben, would you concur? Is planning is, is planning still, um, you know, is work experience rather than planning still valuable in terms of getting a job? Yeah, if at all for my own experience, I actually wrote to, and Helen might remember me, but um, I wrote to Dudley and did two placements with Dudley um, whilst I was doing my course. I also wrote to Birmingham one summer and said, could I come and do a couple of weeks for you and spend a whole summer with Birmingham City Council, which was eye-opening because I worked in the Lazelles area. But also it's worth keeping on some of the private consultancies because some of them do offer summer placements and internships. Some of them, you might not get paid for them, but don't look at it as that you're not being paid. You're looking for the experience to get that on your CV and to show that you're committed to the profession. So work experience is, is really good to show that 
you know you you understand planning as well and that you can get some good experience under your belt quite early on um really um high risk england we try and take placements on as well when we can um it is a bit harder for us at the moment in terms of um, the current situation okay ruth private sector work experience Absolutely. Yeah, we too have got strong links with universities. And as Helen says, it is different at the moment. Um, a lot of the placements that we can do are virtual, more project based, um, certain things like site history research and appraisal tasks um, and sort of mentoring you through that. And you do miss that base to base contact. But anything, any experience you can get is great. And if you can't get an actual placement, then take the time to try and get some experience in sort of developing your soft skills, you know, look at some online courses that you could perhaps do, just any experience to enhance your CV would be great. Yeah, that's true. I mean, just going back to my own career, um, seven years ago when I started out, I was applying for jobs right after university and I had a one month placement at the local authority and that was the difference. Um, some of the same places I was applying to I now had experience and they were interested in, in hiring me. So I would, I would agree with all the panelists to say that work experience, if you can get that, is very, very critical. Uh, moving on to another question um, we have here. And obviously within planning, there are different specialisms. Ben, you're a transport planner, um, you're spatial planners, enforcement, development management. What about specialize, specializing in um, different areas within planning? What if someone doesn't know what area they want to specialize in? What advice will you give to them? Ben, so, so probably starting with you. Um, well, when I left university in 2008, we were going through a similar issue with the economy sort of starting to drop. And I was struggling to get into um, a normal planning role in local government and, and planning uh, plan the private sector at the time. So. I started looking around at what interested me. I've always have been interested in transport infrastructure and transport planning. Um, I've done quite well at a university. So I sort of branched out and started looking out elsewhere. Um, and looking, I've got a job with JMP Consultants, which are now Sistra. And from there, I sort of moved into Coventry City Council, did transport planning there, who helped me do my APC and move forward from there, really. And now I'm kind of back doing actual planning. I'm doing a lot more local plan work, strategy, you know, working on the Black Country Local uh, Plan Review. So if there's something that interests you and you're not sure what's doing, what to do, then it's sometimes beneficial to try and head in that direction at, at the beginning, because you eventually will get back to where you want to be. Um, mm. Also, I think from my experience, from what other, from, from what I've had from applying for jobs and what High Rise England liked was that I've done a mixture. So I, my background was spatial planning and I had a degree in spatial planning. But I've gone into transport and learned about engineering and highway standards and highway development management and control and still done all the planning committees and examination. So it made me a more whole um, sort of a whole skill set for them, um, which I think you can do if you're interested in the environment or flooding. You know, you've got the flood risk management section and um, heritage as well. Um, environmental planning. Uh, our, um, archaeology is another one which seems to be coming big there's a lot of these outside areas also which are really under resourced alongside planning and the planning system needs them really um but i would say yeah if you're looking to specialize have a think see what you're interested in write down the pros and cons sorry bbc is just announcing something um and uh, <laughs> um uh, and take it from there you know um got well at the end of the day what i would say is and i've been lucky is if you find something interesting, it will stand you in good stead. And I've been really fortunate in transport planning and from that respect. Mm. Helen, from a local authority's point of view, um, same question in terms of specialising. Is that something as a hiring manager that you look out for? Is that something that you're keen on or would you prefer someone who's a bit more rounded as a planner? <laughs> It, it's a difficult one from a local planning authority perspective because you do kind of have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. Um, there does, there's an element of development management, uh, planning policy, um, archaeology and historic environment. You, you do have to know a little bit about everything, but I would totally echo what Ben said. I don't feel that most people when they come out of university necessarily know which element of planning they do want to specialise in. I would say try it, try all elements of it and you will find the, the part that suits you. 
um, I've I've done planning policy, development management and planning enforcement. I've always been development management through and through. I found my feet with that very quickly. I enjoyed the spinning plates. I enjoyed the tight deadlines, the having to think fast. Um, and you will find that your skill set matches what you kind of like in the sector. And as a planner, your skill set is broad. So I wouldn't say rule anything out, have a go at it. Even if it's to find out it's not the area you want to specialise in, having an mm -hmm. understanding of that is going to make you uh, more well-rounded in the future, even if it is just a short understanding of processes and procedures. So um, specialism mm -hmm. is great if that's your passion, um, but give everything a go is what I'd say, especially in the early parts of your career. Ruth, I mean, I worked at Martin Wilmore. Uh, I was... Tom Planner, but there were also other members of the team that were doing sustainability, there were architects, there were other different spinning parts. What would you say in terms of specialising from a private consultancy point of view? Yeah, I would agree. I think there's a lot of pressure on people to try and decide on their specialism very early on, and I don't think you necessarily need to. I think from a consultancy point of view, having experience in so many different areas makes you a lot a lot more rounded consultant. You have that knowledge of all the different sectors, how it ties in together, how each sector feeds off each other. And I think the advantage of working in a multidisciplinary is that you see that firsthand. You know, you have a colleague over in sustainability on the other side of the office that you can go and pick their brains and, you know, just get as much experience as you can. Try your hand at lots of different areas if you're if you're unsure and also maximize your exposure. Go to lots of events, talk to people, pick people's brain at any opportunity you have and eventually it'll come you know if there's a specialism that you want to go down the avenue then great but if not I know plenty of directors that are still broader what would you class as a generalist planner and that's okay too. Excellent I mean Ben touched on it slightly um, initially when he spoke about leaving university in 08 and you know us being in a recession global you know recession at the time we've got a question now um, for all the panelists um, how would you how, do, how would the panel assess the outlook of planning in relation to jobs post COVID is it better or worse than the recession in your assessment? I'm going to start with Ruth. Was that me? Sorry, you want to start with? Yes. Start with yeah. you, Ruth. So, so I was recruiting in the last recession as well. Um, we actually set up a company in the recession. Um, so I would say it's a lot better now. Um, in 2008, developers stopped developing, house builders stopped building, and it was just a complete cut off. Now it's just a different way of working. I mean, we are, as Barton Wilmore, we're only slightly behind where we were this time last year. Our fee forecasting for the next six months is good. Um, we're actually um, ahead of where we thought we would be um, this month um, when we looked at things a few months ago. So it's, it's all really positive. Everyone's really busy. And I think that's the stark contrast of 2008. You know, there were a lot of people that have worked straight away um, and not a lot of prospect of, of getting back in anytime soon. Whereas now there's, there's recruitment going on, you know, people are recruiting, so it's, it's a lot more positive. Mm -hmm. Helen? Yeah, echo totally what Ruth said. Um, wasn't in recruitment in 2008, but was working in the local planning authority and remember it well. Um, this is very different. Um, at Dudley, uh, we've taken on six new staff um, since the COVID wow. outbreak. It, we, we've continued recruiting. Um, some of those were uh, due to, well, appointed slightly before um, the, the national lockdown, but nonetheless, we carried through with those posts. They've had a slightly different experience than what they would have done had we been in our, you know, big multidisciplinary office. However, they've uh, thrived in that environment. I've been really, really pleased. Um, at least four of them were new into planning straight from university. Um, they've, they've done incredibly well in that environment. I don't think it's comparable. It's my gut feeling and I do feel that uh, recruitment will continue. There's always going to be a role for planners at whatever discipline you're in and there mm. will be an element of having to get ourselves out of this. This is a temporary situation. It doesn't feel like it while we're in the midst of it, but this is temporary and, and planners are going to be fundamental to the recovery. Uh, and therefore, I, I think recruitment is, is going to be positive and I don't think it's comparable to the 2008 situation. So stay positive would be my, my view. Ben, both Helen and Ruth think that this is not as bad as 08. Do you agree? Um, 
I think it's different. I think it's worse in different circumstances. I think that's the way I put it. I think the profession is, is, is pretty much resilient this time. Um, you know, we have got a shortage of houses. Houses need to be built. We need to build employment. And um, I think a lot of what I'm seeing from my work is a lot of authorities and and as I have, have realised from 2008 and been much more resilient this time to put plans in place to try and protect jobs and do various other aspects. And obviously the government's trying to do that through its COVID measures as well. You know, this is probably short term, um, but and we'll, we'll wait and see. But I think in terms of the planning section, I think from what I'm hearing from my colleagues is jobs are still going, in, especially in the public sector. There's a huge shortage of, of planners of different, different levels in the public sector, and they are call, calling out for them. Um, so if people are looking for jobs, I would say look at the public sector. Um, you know, it can real, provide real value to your career and your skill set. Um, I always felt I was going in the deep end and it was great because you just got had to get on with it. And I learned so much. Um, that's not for everyone, but, um, you know, I wouldn't discount it. Mm, excellent. Um, obviously, you now many people, unfortunately, haven't been working for a few months. And then there is that obviously that gap in their CV. If you've not been able to secure work experience and you're you know, applying for jobs now and you have that gap, how, how best do you think um, that should be presented? What should be said if you're shortlisted for an interview? How, how do you actually um, navigate around that particular circumstance? Ruth? Um, I think don't be afraid to explain what happened. There's no shame in redundancy or, you know, whatever the reason. I think you just use it as a positive to spin how you spent that time. Um, so hopefully you spent the time um, keeping up to date with policy changes, um, enhancing soft skills, um, maybe taking an online course. Um, just try and spin it in a positive way. OK, excellent. Ben? So I completely agree with Ruth, but also I'd go to the RTPI web pages. There is a lot of guidance on the RTPI website around how to construct a CV and advice and guidance are on what to do. In terms of filling that gap as well, if you haven't been able to get a placement or you haven't got a job, look at what opportunities there are through the RTPI. You know, there is the uh, Chief Planners of Tomorrow scheme as well, where mm -hmm. you can shadow um, some of our key planners. And I know Dudley has been an active part of that. Um, and so is Birmingham City Council, so both Helen Martin at Dudley and, and Maria Dunn at, at, at Birmingham. So, you know, there are those opportunities. Um, but, you know, as Ruth said, use your soft skills um, try and relate it. If you see a job advert, relate to those skills to the job advert to demonstrate actually they are transferable across. Customer service is a key one. Planners on a day to day basis have to be face to face and know how to interact with a number of customers in different situations. That's a really good one to try and show that, that you've done. If you even if you've got a temporary job in the in the period or, or as we've said, developing your soft skills. Mm, this is a very good point. I used to work at a local authority and a lot of the time we had to interact with members of the public. So soft skills is a good point. Helen, um, as a local authority planner, what would you expect um, someone to say to you coming um, with a gap on their CV? How would you um, look at it positively? Yeah, um, be honest about the gap is what I would say, exactly what we've said, um, uh, and tackle it head on. Um, as recruitment, as part of the recruitment process for local authority, we're, we're trying to look for gaps because obviously we want to understand how that how that career um, for that individual has progressed. So be honest about it, um, reflect on it, and let us know what you've tried to do in the in the interim. You know, everyone who finds themselves in that position is not going to get a job straight away, and we neither do we expect people to do to do that. Um, what mm. have you done? What have you tried? And how have you took um, the only, your own initiative to fill the gap? And that needn't necessarily be a planning role in the short term, like Ben said. Anything that you are taking up, you know, planners have a, a broad skill set. I can't stress that enough. And anything you do is going to tap into those skills you're going to need as, as a well-rounded planner. So, but uh, my key point be honest about the gap and what you've tried to do during that interim period excellent i mean one of the things that ruth touched on earlier was um, improving skills whilst you know this downtime is going on we've, we've had a very interesting question for the panel um what are your thoughts on the planning white papers obviously you know, within this whole period um, of the lockdown, the government has issued this new planning white paper. 
What are your thoughts on that and how will that impact the planning industry in terms of persons getting jobs, um, roles of planners itself as a whole? It's a bit of a broader question, but how do you think, you know, someone's at home, they've been reading the planning white paper, looking at the PD rights changes, um, upper extensions and all the rest of that. What do you think is going to be the impact of that on the planning industry? Probably start with Ben this time. So, yeah, the, when it, what, the planning white paper is an interesting one. Um, it's come out and personally, I don't feel it says a lot exactly of what's going on, um, but we knew no change in reform is coming. From my perspective as a transport planning specialist, I don't expect much to change in my role. I expect on behalf of High Resing to be involved in the local plan process, pulling together the evidence base uh, and doing that. And from the DM side, reviewing applications to understand the impact on our network. So those jobs are still going to be needed. Those roles are still going to be needed. The same with local planning authorities. Even with the move to PD uh, and those rights and, and the move away in local plans, we still need planners to undertake the local plan work. We still need planners to do the assessments on the big scale applications. And we still need the private sector to help develop those applications, those skills. So yes, it sounds like we're going to take a hit and, and a bit of a hit in the planning white paper, but actually in reality, I don't think it's going to be as bad as it sounds. Um, mm. I think we will still be here as a profession. Um, and you know, the RTPI has been quite strong in our position on that. As, a, as an institute as well, as, as a member of that institute. So uh, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Planning will change, the processes will change, but we'll still be here. <laughs> that, that's very encouraging to hear, Ben. Uh, uh, Ruth, do you agree? Will we still be here as planners? Does the white paper scupple our profession or does it you know, give us a new and a different breath uh, of life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, planners are always going to be here. I think any changes in planning um, makes consultants especially even more valuable. Um, you know, they've got to keep abreast of these changes, advise clients, um, we'll definitely still be here. I don't think there's any any worry around that. Helen? Yeah, um, totally agree with what's been said. Big question, isn't it? What the white paper is going to going to do? Uh, I agree with Ben. Um, there's a lot of broad brush discussion as part of the white paper, but no meat on the bones. And um, I'm rather long in the tooth being here doing this a while, and it's not unusual for these kind of whole set, whole scale changes to become apparent every now and again. Changes to permitted development rights has been going on for quite a long time. Um, the government always um, it doesn't really matter what colours are nailed to the flag. But planning often gets the blame for having a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy and slowing down the process. Um, we've become resilient to it. It's a really key skill as a planner. You, you have to have broad shoulders and you have to be resilient. You have to adapt to the changes that come with central government guidance. And we do that. And it may tweak our roles and change our roles, but I don't think it undermines our roles in any great um, in the great scheme of things. So yes, we'll still be here. We may have to apply ourselves differently. Uh, like Ruth said, the consultants will have to learn this and advise clients. As local planning authority uh, planners, we have to understand how it's applied, how to enforce mm -hmm. against it, and how to work with the prior notification processes that inevitably go with these new changes. So mm -hmm. we adapt and we change, but I don't think it undermines what we do. Good. That's that's very encouraging to hear. Uh, Ruth, probably going to start off with this second, this other question here for you. What are the advantages of going through a graduate scheme in the private sector after graduating? I, I think I need to ask everyone as well whether or not your organisation offers a graduate scheme when I come to you. But Ruth, any advantage in a graduate scheme? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the main advantage is that it's a structured framework. You're joining alongside other graduates at the same time, so you have that peer support. Um, it's a structured programme of training, um, all introduced at the right time. Um, you get experience of um, other disciplines, joining a multidisciplinary. Um, it's that it's that exposure and um, structured help and support um, that's, that's key, I think, with joining a, a structured programme. Okay, yep. Helen? Yeah, um, 
I speak from a Dudley perspective, we don't have a specific graduate programme. I know local authorities do. Um, Birmingham certainly does. Um, we have an assistant planning officer role, which is kind of an entry level if you strike from university. Um, we would expect a minimal level of work experience, but that is a very supported role. That is something where you would you would deal with planning applications. You would have an input on the local plan and the review um, and the local plan policies. But it would be very supported and very mentored. We don't do it specifically at Dudley, but I think anyone who's looking for opportunities out there, it is a great way of having an introduction to the um, the career your career path, and it will give you a taste of different parts of the the service area that you're in. Um, so I would be a big advocate for it. But what I would say is, if you're looking at local authorities specifically that don't offer it, don't rule out their entry level. Um, uh, assistant level posts and that kind of thing which will give you equally as well rounded an experience. Mm. Ben, does Highways England offer a grad scheme? Are you a fan of it? Is it good? So we we have graduate scheme but we do not have one for spatial planning. Um, so we have a bit like Helen, we have a system spatial plan post which people can come into from university and obviously it's a supported post. One thing I would say from my own experience about having gone through a graduate scheme was that you need to be a bit careful with them. They are provided by the private sector, but in the public sector, you don't have them. And this is what I want to say is that don't just head to the private sector because you get that. The public sector in itself, yes, doesn't necessarily have a set out scheme, but it does have a very supportive environment. You will get a senior case officer. You produce your professional development plan every year and set out your requirements and your aims and aspirations. When I was at Coventry, I was completing my APC. I kept failing on one part, which was implementing strategies because in my role, I didn't do it. So I spoke to the head of planning um, at, at, at Coventry. I was then seconded one day, two days a week to do um, a review of homes in multiple occupation for the city as part of a, a study into student areas and developed a strategy from that, which then became part of the local plan. I then ticked the box on my APC and moved on. So. Don't discount local government just because you're in a structured approach doesn't mean uh, in an unstructured situation doesn't mean you're going to get the same level of support opportunities to get that and then get your APC and chartership um, as well in that process. That's the only note I would say, but it's down to personal preference, really down to the actual individual. Some people like a structured environment. I don't. I kind of like chaos. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of better for me. As, as Helen says, keeping the plates spinning. And hearing that you're doing a good job is, is the way I tend to work, but everyone's different. Mm, okay, we have another interesting um, sort of cover letter specific question that's just come through. Um, probably going to start off with Ruth. What stands out in a supporting statement slash cover letter? Um, this person has tried to cover all aspects of their person specific specifications, but so far, unfortunately, they haven't had any interviews what isn't happening right what should they do differently potentially i think try not to make it too lengthy keep it to the main point so i always try and advise um three middle paragraphs with the opening and a closing so the opening highlights what you're applying for and um, where you found it if you have any common connections um and then straight into why you're suitable um, and highlight some key skills. Um, I'll then go into some quantifiable examples. So if you've worked on similar schemes, um, mention numbers, you know, size of schemes, things like that. Um, or if it's your first position, um, transferable skills. Um, and then in the last one, I'd just reiterate that and um, show that we research the company um what's attracted you to them and then close it um with the opportunity for a meeting but i think rather than sort of waffle and try and mention everything that's in your cv in your covering letter as well um you've got to remember that people are reading big piles of cvs and cover letters they want to see the main points on that page um so yeah just try and keep it short and snappy with it but with all the key points mm. speaking about big piles helen you, you, you're sat in the office or you're sat at home and you're, you're recruiting for this one assistant kind of role and there are 10 CVs that come in, 10 cover letters. What are you looking for in that one cover letter that's going to set it apart? Absolutely. Um, Ruth kind of touched on it really. There's a lot to sift through. So make my job easy is what I would say to people. 
put the key points first. Tell me what your relevant skills are for this job and why you're applying for it. D keep it simple, professional, not too elaborate. And what I can't stress enough is looking through the personal specification and the job description that's associated with the post you're applying for and hit those key points. If it's talking about ability to communicate with, in different ways, if it's talking about time management, customer service, tell me how you've done that. But keep it short. I don't need um, war and peace at this point. You've got to remember that this is to get you to the interview stage. That is when you can then elaborate on those points and tell me your examples in detail. So keep it short and to the point, but hit those key points within the personal specification and the job description. That is what's going to tick the boxes in order to get you to the next step, which is your job interview. You know, this is your first opportunity to kind of demonstrate that you're the right person to go to that next step. Um, keep it professional and hit those key points. Mm, interesting. Ben, what are you looking for in a cover letter? So uh, when I was at Warwick, I did a lot of recruitment for the highways development management team. And like Helen and Andrew said, I had a huge poll to sift through. I was looking for ones actually that also stepped out in personality. So I could sort of get a sense of that, who, how that, who that person was. A lot of response, uh, a lot of them, what I got are very robotic. Um, you know, it's sort of like, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this. And I'm not really getting a sense for the person, how they tick and how they work. And that's what I'm trying to get a sense of to see if they're ready, if they're, if they're suitable for the post. It's very hard from, paper, from a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Hitting the job specification is critical because that tends to be, and I'll give you a tip, this is what we score off. So we used to score off the job specification in terms of, in, in local government, in terms of how you meet that criteria. Um, and that's the critical aspect. Go through it, but uh, as Helen says, be brief, but try and be as detailed as you can. Uh, <laughs> because if you just say, I've done customer service, that's not going to help you. How have you done customer service? Is there a particular example that sticks out in your mind where you've delivered good customer service? Is there something where you've had to perhaps challenge your boss on something and it's led to a change in how your organization's done something, you know? And if you're a new planner, you know, and you don't have ex work experience, that's when you need to tailor it to the job and the experiences that you have. So when I left university, I used examples like I worked in a union shop, I worked in a bar, um, you know, and, and using that as an interface to show you demonstrate skills alongside your work experience. That, that's critical, but do not make it war and peace because I do not, I won't have time to read it. Um, the worst one I had was I had a CV which was 10 pages. They literally listed everything wow. they've ever done. Um, so yeah, tailor it and keep it quite narrative um, in terms of that. But also, you know, in terms of your qualifications as well, that can take up a lot of space. Summarise them because they, in local government, we will ask to see them anyway. But do summarise them. Um, okay. Okay. We've got a couple of questions um, quite similar. Uh, about graduates who are at university and they don't have any experience and they seem to not have any time as well. So one question here is, lots of graduate planning roles ask for 12 month experience in industry. How do I get around this if I don't have any experience at all and I'm trying to apply? Another one um, says, um, advice for any students who are looking for work experience during their course what would be some good ways to get insights into the planning process? Are there any part-time opportunities available? And maybe an opportunity, an opportunity to join a neighborhood planning group. So I guess the two questions are, I'm at university, I'm busy doing my dissertation, I'm busy doing my courses, probably having a bit of fun as well, but I'm trying to get a job. How do I balance all of that? Ruth. Um, I think they've hit the nail on the head with some of the suggestions, actually, that they talked about, um, um, you know, sort of Ruth? Seem to have uh, lost Ruth for a second. I'm going to come back to you, Ruth. I'm going to pass over to Ben in the meantime. Um, same question. So I had this issue when I was obviously at university myself and obviously I was up in Sheffield and um, I lived, uh, my family are based in Dudley, I'm from, I'm from Dudley. Um, so I used to utilise my holidays um, and I literally emailed my local authority, which was Dudley, and just asked if I could come and do some experience and I did 
one Easter I did a week in planning policy and another Easter I did a week in DM. Um, and I just emailed people. So I emailed Birmingham and asked if I could go to the Commons over the summer holidays. And I think I did about four weeks with them. There's no harm in asking. Mm. Um, you know, I also did a, a three months to comment with GVA Grimley because I saw an advert that they had on their website and went in and worked and did indoor sports facilities in London, um, which was, in, you know, and it's just asking. You have to be a bit bolshy sometimes. Um, I appreciate you're all busy and you've got workloads to do. Um, but, you know, if you've got some time in the holidays and you're thinking, what can I do? You know, going and helping a local planning authority or someone is a, is a great opportunity. They'll always be uh, quite happy to have an extra pair of hands. Um, mm. I think I had a, a planning application myself in my own house and I think a student dealt with it. So um, that was uh, a bit odd having two planning officers turn up at my front door. But, um, you know, um, you know, that's what the profession's for. We're not going to turn people away as well. And um, if, if needs be, I think the RTPI can provide contacts um you know to so to some of those authorities as well um just get in touch with your rtpi branch as well excellent helen how does a master's student um get experience and apply for a job yeah it's chicken and egg isn't it um i need some experience but i can't get a job can't get a job so i can't get experience so it, it, i massively appreciate the frustrations but it really is putting yourself out there it is being prepared to spend your easter holidays and spend a couple of weeks of your summer break in a local plan authority or in a local consultancy picking up those skills and gaining that experience it will be on a voluntary basis you won't be paid for it and it is about looking at that as a massive positive despite the fact you won't be being paid for that internship the experience that you gain and the knowledge that you gain is is going to set you apart from the other candidates on a very very market level it's you, you cannot put a price on it and a lot of the sifting that we have to do because for every assistant planning officer job we have there's 30 to 50 applicants for each one so mm. a very quick sift is about experience and it doesn't have to be a year I know the graduate schemes will very often say one to years experience it, it's about some work experience and that literally could be a couple of weeks over the Easter break but it's about sending those emails putting yourself out there and asking those questions and you will find a lot more people receptive to, to taking on students because it's the only way to break that barrier of how can I get employed when I've got no experience and a lot of mm. authorities and companies appreciate that excellent uh, Ruth yeah, sorry, Daniel, I think there's some interference there, so forgive me if I'm repeating some of this. I'm not sure how much you heard. Um, but uh, yeah, so lots of positions do ask for up to 12 months experience. Um, ours is up to 12 months experience for the graduate scheme. We fully appreciate that not everyone has experience, but what I would advise is just contacting lots of um, companies, local authorities, trying to get some experience and just be prepared to do it at the weekend. Um, I mean, we do offer placements, but we also offer sort of project support. Um, you know, we can set a project and, and get you to work on that. And you, you just need to do that in your spare time. I know dissertations do take up a lot of time, but you know, you've, you've just got to put the work in to, to get that experience and get over that first hurdle. It's, it's probably the biggest hurdle that you'll have, actually. <laughs> Once you're through that and in somewhere, then obviously the, the doors are wide open. But I appreciate the frustration. Mm. Got another question coming. Um, I'm going to point this one to Ben, actually, as a former chair of the RTPA in the West Midlands. Um, how desirable is becoming a chartered member of the RTPI to employers and should working towards one's APC be considered a priority after graduating? Ben? So the APC and being a chartered RTPI gives you the, the, the accreditation that you are a fully qualified professional, which is recognised by the planning profession, but wider. Um, from my experience as well, it means when I've stood at examination in public for local plans or public inquiries, I can state I'm a, I'm a chartered member of the RTPI and I understand what I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, but, um, you know, it gives you that. Um, it's down to the person, really. I graduated in 2008. I didn't actually get my APC, I think, till 2013. So I was a bit of a slow one, but that's partly because I wanted to make sure I took my time. Um, to get the experience that's needed. A lot of people run straight out to university and go straight into accreditation, um, but it, it depends on the person. Um, mm. 
but it, it is valid to have it is recognized by employers they do they do need they, they, they do like it but in, in the private sector I find that you do the graduate scheme alongside your APC and Ruth will probably oh, comment yeah. on that further and then you sort of get your promotion if you've got your APC from what my friend's experience was but in the public sector it's really at your own pace um, um, and obviously you're building on your professional development plan with your um, with your uh, your manager but also if you you know there might be people on here that don't have a planning qualification that is accredited for the APC process mm -hmm. there are alternative routes there's now the associate route um, that you can take through um, as well so if you do a certain level of experience I think it's over 10 years um, you can utilize the associate route and I know some of my colleagues in transport planning especially because they don't have plan degrees but they do a lot of planning are also are utilizing that route so if you become a specialist you can utilize that route as well so you know it, it, it is recognized um, and you know it doesn't necessarily have to professional institutes there's there's a few others as well regarding the specialisms around so like landscape architects institute the transport planning society um, and those and the rtpi affiliates with all of those so it, it's really just have a look around as well in terms of that and see which institutes you want to go to but um, hopefully i've answered the question and not just warbled on <laughs> Helen, uh, I mean, I used to work at a local authority and it wasn't a massive priority at the time. Is it something that you, you encourage? Is it important um, to become chartered? Yeah, it's very relevant to the profession. And I think a lot of people who are in the profession strive towards it. I don't think it's important to do it straight from university. I think there's um, a balance to be struck between gaining relevant and important experience and then putting your IPC forward when you have that kind of more well-rounded view of the profession. Um, it's not a prerequisite for local authority a lot of the time anymore. Um, back in the day it used to be. Um, it isn't a prerequisite but I do think it's an important part of professional development and I think anyone who is in the profession and has been for a long time does strive towards that at some point during the career but I would encourage some experience and a bit of being involved in different elements of planning before putting your IPC together because Ben touched on sometimes if you're short of a little element of it you won't get through the criteria anyway so gain that experience but never never lose sight of it I would say I think it's always something to strive towards. Mm. Ruth in private sector I, I, I've obviously I'm in private sector now and it's something that is highly desirable you want to yeah. add a little bit more on that? Yeah, so there is a lot more emphasis on it actually in the private sector. I mean, as Ben and Helen have touched on, it is um, obviously the accreditation for your degree. So it's, it is nice to do it and um, become chartered and be recognised for it. But in the private sector, um, and I guess that's another advantage of going through a graduate programme, um, as Ben said, it does run alongside um, the APC period of, of being that time before you can submit. And it often does, not always, but often does result in promotion at the end. Um, of course, we want to make sure you've got all the experience to become a planner before that promotion. But more than likely, if you followed the training programme and um, successfully, Fully submitted, then you would you would have reached that. Um, but past senior planner level, it's very rare um, to achieve promotion if you're not chartered in the mm. private sector. So I think if there is a bit of a delay, try and get it done by the time you get to that level. Mm. You don't want it to hold you back. Excellent. A slightly related question, and this applies to to sort of me in a way. Um, Hello, coming from a BSc politics and economics background, would you recommend pursuing further education to gain chartership with no experience in the industry? I know I, I had a, uh, a management studies background and then I did a town planning masters. Um, you know, would you recommend a similar route, Helen, um, for someone with a different background? Yeah, um, quite similar to myself, my, my degree was environmental management and then went into planning at a technical support level. So kind of developed from that perspective and was promoted a few times from there. Um, I then did my master's whilst working. Um, so mm. I was sponsored by um, the local authority who funded that and gave me day release to do it on a part time basis over two years. So rather than a one year full time, it's uh, two years part time doing a day a week. Worked oh. very well. It's, it's tough because you're trying to do it whilst working full time. But with the support of the colleagues around you um, and the experience of people who've also been through it, I found it quite a positive experience. So I do think 
whilst it's very academic when you're doing study at master's level I do think it gives you a good grounding if you've come from a different discipline but again the beauty of planning is you can bring different disciplines together and with the skill set that's required you can be equally as effective as someone who has trained through a pure town planning route because I, like I say I didn't do that myself and it worked pretty well so yes I would advise that once you've got some experience as well and you've familiarised yourself with the uh, the sector it's worth pursuing. Ben? What do, you, what do you recommend as um, probably I guess from an RTPI point of view as well in terms of having a particular um, subject um, initially should someone get further education and then become chartered or should they just stay within that the area and then become um, experienced and go forward I don't seem to have lost it for a second there Ben On phones in. I can hear you, Ben. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm back. Uh, you all froze on my screen, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think from my perspective is that I think it's changed slightly from having to go and do a master's in an accredited approach, especially with the associate route that's opened up for the RTPI as well. When I've done recruitment, I've recruited someone from um, bio, a, bio, a biomolecular biology background and they really had the analytical skills to do transport planning because they were meticulous um you know looking in data into detail in data um we've had someone who politics and um, journalism um a variety of backgrounds but i think it, it's for local for my experience in local government it's identifying how you meet the skill sets as we've spoken before and a lot of those degree courses you do actually meet the skill sets for planning and some of the specialisms around it it's it is beneficial to go and get accredited and get an RTPI qualification. I'm not going to lie, I'm a big advocate of it and promoting the RTPI, but it's not everyone's bag to go and do further education when they've already done a degree. And you know, there is a cost associated with that. Um, my old employer wouldn't have supported you to do, do a further degree. You'd have to pay it out of your own pocket. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it's quite expensive. So I think, I think times have changed and I think that's where the associate route opens up more in terms of getting a credit for the RTPI. It takes longer, yes, but you still have that option if you don't want to go and do further education, um, really. So I hope I hope that answers the question. Um, you all kind of froze. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, any thoughts um, to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on where you are with your career. So obviously, if you have a different degree and you're in a role and you're adamant that you want to become a planner through and through, then, yeah, I would suggest um, studying and becoming chartered. But as Ben said, there are other routes available. You can still become chartered without doing the master's on top. So I think it depends, A, in the role that you're in, um, B, where you want to go and see the support that you have from your employer um you know as, as ben said the masters is expensive um if they can fund it then that might make the decision easier but i think um yeah it, it just depends on your aspirations really and how sure you are that that's the direction you want to go in mm. we've got a couple of questions here related to international students um so the first one is do private companies hire international students in their graduate schemes probably one for you to, to to think about Ruth while I continue reading the question um, I've seen that some companies are in the home office um, register and um, they need applicants to have a visa to allow them to stay in the UK for at least five years another one um, more broadly probably for Ben as an international master's student sustainable transport planning and having an experience having some experience how do i use that in applying for jobs in the uk but we're going to start with um you ruth if you don't mind about international students and applying for jobs within the uk environment yeah absolutely so international students will have um, a student visa and whilst they're on that we can absolutely provide work experience placements um I believe, don't quote me on this because I'm not an um, expert on the visas, but I believe the visas are changing um, to allow more time after study on, on the visa that they have before they have to renew. Um, and we can obviously employ on that basis. We, we do also support visas. We do have international candidates working for us at the moment. Um, so we're familiar with that process and it is something that we can do. 
At graduate level, it's a little bit more tricky because, of course, to have someone working for you on a visa, you do have to be able to prove that there aren't other candidates from the UK able to do that job. So at graduate level, it's it's highly competitive and it's a little bit trickier. Um, hopefully, the visa changes will obviously will help with that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we offer and support. Okay, uh, Ben. International students, in particular, the one who spoke about being a um, transport um, planner. I think my, my view would be, as we've said before, is to demonstrate your experience and make sure you meet the uh, job specification. But um, having to be very careful where I tread in HR speak, um, you would need to also identify your right to work being a public authority. Um, so my advice would be to obviously review the, the advice on the Home Office website or the Gov website regarding mm -hmm. visas and what you're entitled to. You know, uh, I would say for anyone who's an international uh, person looking to come and get a job in the UK, you know, we do have a skill shortage across a lot of our job areas in planning. Um, I know my colleagues uh, in London or friends in London who work in planning have a lot of colleagues who are from Australia and New Zealand, um, especially in local government down there. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really good opportunity to come and, and work in the country at the moment. In transport planning, it's it's a, vi a varied background in terms of where people come from. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't have the visa issue or anything to try and put you off. But I would say, read up on it. Read up on the Gov website. Re speak to perhaps ask HR when you see the job application. Speak up, uh, ring up and speak to someone in HR in either the private organisation or or in the public authority to give you advice about how to take your application forward. You know, hmm. we are here to help as well as, um, you know, looking to recruit. I would say it's a two way street. You know, you've got to make sure that company is going to be the best for you as well. And through that is, is interacting with them to make sure you get your answers, uh, the answers to your questions, basically. Yeah, I had a couple of colleagues as well from Australia when I was at a local authority. Um, speaking of which, Helen, any international planners at Dudley, and is this something that you're, you know, looking for welcomed? Yeah, we don't at the moment have done in the past, um, mainly on temporary contracts. But we'd echo what Ben said, really, um, from a public sector perspective, it's all about ability to work in the UK. So making sure that you've got the appropriate um, visas and ability to do that. We have a separate HR department who are more than capable of advising on specifics for individuals. And yeah, I mean, we would always welcome international students, you know, any new ideas, you know, new perspectives, anything like that is always going to be welcome um, for across any student population. Really. Okay. Um, just a few more minutes to go. We have a couple of other questions. Um, obviously, we're living in a very um, not face to face world anymore, increasingly so. How important is LinkedIn? Ruth? It's become increasingly important over the last couple of years. It's probably been the fastest growing platform that I've known. Um, and it's so versatile. So, I mean, I would say it's either all or nothing. Um, if you're going to have a profile on LinkedIn, make sure you're utilising all the features on there. Um, have a really, anyway, if I receive a CV, um, I'm going to look you up on LinkedIn. Um, so just make sure that your profile is snappy, you've got all your experience on there. Um, you can use it to follow companies as well, which will help you with your interview prep and writing those cover letters. You can find little nuggets of information that aren't on their websites, for example, if you look at their activity and follow their pages. Um, you can search for jobs on it, you can post jobs on it. It's it's really versatile and, and I think a really important and part of the recruitment world. Mm. Helen, LinkedIn, is it important? Yeah, I think it is. Um, again, from a public sector perspective, we're often slow off the mark with things like this. So we are a little bit behind the trend with it. Um, but like Ruth said, something we're going to look people up on, check out uh, potential candidates on. And we do post jobs on there as well. So whilst it's a developing area in the public sector, certainly something that's really, really grown and something to be engaged with fully if you are going to engage in it. Mm. Ben? On a word on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, is, LinkedIn is really important. Um, it's important on lots of different levels, really. It's a good way of also reading up people's views and opinions on, you know, we talked about the white paper. There's a lot of opinions on the white paper, um, you know, from different sectors. 
Um, it's a good way of communicating with your peers as well in terms of there's the Young Planners group, for example, and you can ask questions and, and people will feed into that. Um, I would say keep it up to date. I had to update my, pic my profile picture today. I'm no longer the 22 year old that I had on there. <laughs> yeah, a lot older. Um, so um, I would say keep it up to date. But some of my posts that have been the most interactive was um, in lockdown, I was cleaning out my parents' loft and found my Matchbox motorway set and I set it all up and took a photo of it. And the amount of people who engaged on it say, I had that when I was a kid and now I'm a transport planner and I'm one as well. You know, it, it's funny just, you know, certain things, but it's a really good way of talking to people and connecting uh, as a profession. So I, I really rate it. Mm, okay. Um, last question for each of you. What is your single best interview tip and have you seen something from a particular candidate that stood out that you can recall? Ben? Oh, I've got quite a few tips. Why did you, why did you make me go just hoping the others would uh, count them with it? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go over to Helen and come back to you. Okay, no problem. Pass the book there, Ben. Thank you. <laughs> um, my best interview tip, and this is going to sound really predictable, but be prepared go into your interview having done as much research about the company you are going to as you possibly can and having looked into detail about what that job expects of you if you were to be the successful candidate so what does the job description and the personal specification show you as essential skills what do they what do they determine you need to be go in prepared and have examples good examples of how you demonstrate those key features that that uh, job description and ultimately that job role is going to need from you so be prepared be prepared be prepared is the best tip that I can offer it's very obvious when people haven't prepared for an interview mm. and again when you've got a full day of interviews you're going to remember the people who have got that information across to you and have asked the right questions as well another good tip always have a question about the company or about the job but if you've done your research and you've looked into that post and that company that day will come naturally so preparation is the best tip that I can offer anybody. Speaking about preparation, Ben? Thanks Dan. I was prepared. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my tip would be um, be yourself, don't be a robot. Um, we want to see your personality, understand who you are as a person. Please, you know, don't, it's hard because you're meeting people for the first time that you've never met before, but you know, I've had it before where people have put a facade up and you're trying to break that facade down because you really want to understand that person because you need to know if they're going to work within your team but at the same time you need to understand if you're going to fit in with that team so if you're if you're not willing to break down that facade you know you think but remember who your audience is um memorable one that i had was a guy turned up in tracksuit and a cap when i was at warwickshire um and then slouched in his seat and well, obviously he didn't get the job but um Please dress professionally for your interview. Look smart. And um, one of the key things I always look down, I always used to get told off by my boss was people's shoes. If you had uh, scuff shoes or they were untidy, it made me think whether you were really that interested in your appearance and the work you were going to do. So, um, yeah, that would be my tip and uh, memorable person. <laughs> <laughs> Last word from you, Ruth. Um, you know, what is your best interview tip? And do you have anything that you remember that stood out from one of your um, candidates? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the two most important things are be, being prepared and being yourself. But I think another key one is to really listen in the interview. Um, really take time to listen to the question that's being asked of you and take your time answering it. And try not to go off on a tangent. Even ask at the end of your answer if you've answered the question satisfactorily and if if they ask it in a slightly different way you know you haven't <laughs> so um yeah really take time to listen and i think the person that really stood out for me i mean you're always going to ask comes back to the preparation point you're always going to be asked what you know about the company and we always get the same answers they spout facts from our website you know you've got 14 offices through the UK blah 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 um what really stood out for me is when someone mentioned a scheme that wasn't obvious on our website because it was of a real interest to them 
um, and their interest area and that really showed that they've gone beyond just looking at our about page on the website and you know the first few projects that pop up they've really delved and and looked into their interest areas and picked a project that's really relevant to them and they were able to talk about that in a lot of detail and that really stood out for me excellent excellent that sounds like a very very interesting um kind of and, and did that person get the job by by any chance Ruth? they did Okay, good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ruth, Helen, and Ben, for your time this evening. I'm sure all the delegates who were here have been very grateful and thankful for your time. Um, it, it's been very interesting hearing from different parts um, of, of the planning sector. Obviously, Ben from a government um, agency, Helen from a local authority, and Ruth from a private um, consultancy. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And hopefully some of the tips that you've left with us today will get many more of our young planners employed in the not too distant future. I'd also like to thank the West Midlands Young Planners Committee for organizing this event, and in particular, Ella Sumner, our coordinator for putting it all together. Um, we'd like to thank the RTPI for you know, facilitating opportunities like this for discourse, for networking and for knowledge sharing and finally thank you very much for coming to our webinar and look forward to other CPDs and other seminars going forward um, and do tell us what you think um, we have a Twitter page at RTPA West Midlands and um, if you have any time complete the survey and um, you can leave a comment about Ben's um, non-answer before um, yeah, <laughs> if you want to if not, it's fine. But yeah, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the evening and we look forward to seeing you in, in our other events going forward. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.